it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to the Chief Scientist and Director of Science, Education and Conservation at the Botanic Gardens, Sydney, Professor Brett Summerall. Brett is a plant pathologist and a fungi expert. He leads a team of world-class plant scientists at the gardens and has been instrumental in the establishment of the Plant Clinic, the Australian Plant Bank, and the National Herbarium of New South Wales. He is a dedicated advocate for plant conservation and has contributed up to 150 journal articles, books, parts of books, and he's helped describe 120 new fungi species. So please, put your hands together for Professor Brett Summerall. Thanks, Louise, for that lovely introduction. I'm a plant pathologist, so I will tend to focus more on the plant disease side of these things, but it's just really important to recognise when talking about all of these things that nothing lives alone, nothing is based on their on their own. So we have to consider the environment, we have to consider the changes in the environment, we have to consider the changes in the host, changes in the way in which we, we deal with things. So what I'll try to do is to put that into context, but focusing in my talk at least a little bit about the pathogen, because uh, that's where we come from. I've been working at the gardens as a pathologist for 35 and a bit years now. Most of that time our focus has been on Phytophthora. So I'll, I'll start off talking a little bit about that and then move into to some of the other aspects of that. So I'm going to focus initially a bit talking about Phytophthora, but I'll throw in a couple of other diseases towards the end and a few other issues, and happy later on when we talk where we have time for, uh, for discussions and, and questions to answer any questions about that. So a little bit to start around about Phytophthora, and I know I've got too many slides and I'll try to fit too much in, but that's just the nature of a scientist. Phytophthora literally means plant destroyer. It's Latin for, for plant destroyer. So it's a really apt name. It's a fungal-like group of organisms, so they're not true fungi, and this is really important in terms of management and control later on when we're, we're talking about that. The most important of the species that we have in this country is Phytophthora cinnamome. Sometimes you'll see it called the cinnamon fungus in some of the older literature, even though it's not a fungus, but it is the species that really affects native vegetation, agriculture, horticulture, and, and amenity planting, so really is a difficult thing. There are a group of organisms that are very difficult to identify, to isolate, it, it is a skill in terms of the diagnosis of these pathogens, and there's only a couple of labs in New South Wales that do it, the, the group at EMAI and our group at, at Plant Clinic at the uh, Royal Botanic Garden, Sydney, and was very much focused on molecular identification now, very similar to the process that you would be familiar with COVID. We think these pathogens, the most aggressive of these pathogens, have been here since the early days of the colony. And they probably came from their point of origin in Borneo, Southeast Asia, probably through the trading efforts and activities of the, the Dutch East Indies companies coming out of uh, places like Jakarta and the, the like, probably on citrus trees and, and issues like that. Roughly 91 species in Australia, we're still describing species, we're still discovering species, this will probably continue to go up. We have some native species, so not all of them are going to necessarily be bad, but the ones that we know that are, are quite bad have been those that have been introduced from elsewhere. So species like Phytophthora cinnamomi, Phytophthora multivora, species like that have been introduced from other parts of the world and our flora and particularly some of the species that we grow have no inbuilt resistance to those diseases. So they're quite what we call naive in terms of their ability to fight the pathogen. We tend to see it as a problem in those areas where we get more than 600 millimetres of rain a year or we get periods of time when there's significant inundation of water. And I'll talk a lot about the importance with these pathogens of water on both their biology, their ability to infect and then conversely how a lack of water can cause the symptoms of these disease to be much more aggressive and much more um, symptomatic. Really where we've detected it has been those areas around the edge of the continent from the ranges to the coast where we get that period of rainfall that's greater than 600 millimetres 
or so. So really significant problems in Western Australia where you get Jarrah dieback and mass devastation in natural ecosystems in that part of the world through Kangaroo Islands, parts of South Australia, Victoria and Tasmania. A lot of the species in Tasmania are very sensitive to it. And then up the east coast, we see sorts of different problems. And what we have tended to, to think about in the past is a lot of the east coast species were relatively resistant to the disease but I think as we're starting to see changes in climate and changes in the environmental conditions we're seeing species become more susceptible or more impacted by these pathogens. It's the most important disease of trees and shrubs in Australia whether you're talking about exotics being grown in your gardens, native species grown in the natural ecosystems or tree crops in, in a horticultural situation species like avocado, stone fruit, citrus, these are really can be impacted nastily by these sorts of disease. It has a huge host range and we probably don't know the extent of the host range at this stage. It could be thousands, tens of thousands of species. Everything happens below ground and it's really often very difficult to know what's happening when, when the disease starts because you cannot see it. The organism is micro microscopic and I'll reinforce that several times because this makes it a really nasty, difficult organism to work with because you can't see what's happening. It's all below ground and everything's microscopic. So it's a real pain from that perspective. Once an area is infested, that area remains infested. It's almost impossible to eradicate it completely once the area is infested. And although we have had this pathogen for a long period of time, we keep getting new ones in, so biosecurity is still critically important. We don't want to be moving these pathogens around. We don't want to be reintroducing new species into new areas. People quite often ask me, aren't we just wasting our time um, trying to prevent movement of these pathogens around? The answer is definitively no. The more we can do to prevent it moving around, the more likely we are to, to to resolve some of these issues. So huge host range, host plants, you name it, if it's green, it's probably getting it to some, some extent. So it's really difficult. But we do know that it goes across all sorts of different plant families, probably 416 host genera, but that's probably a huge underestimation. Um, exotic and native species, as I said, and it's trees, shrubs, can be herbaceous species and annual species on certain occasions, but really where we see the biggest impact is with trees and shrubs. So those woody species that you're seeing getting infected. A little bit about the life cycle, because that's really important in terms of being able to understand this pathogen, how it moves, what you've got to do, how you've got to treat it in terms of the, the environment that you're working for. It has several different life stages through it, and it's really complicated, and I don't really want to get too devilly down into the details, but this gives you a little bit of a, an idea about it from that point of view. It can produce asexually, i.e. without sex, and produce large numbers of infective propagules very, very quickly on a root system. It can survive for long periods of time through these structures we call clematospores. So these clematospores can survive in the soil for long periods of time. So this is what I say, when it's in the soil system, it's there for long periods of time. And we've done work showing that you can come back 10 years later, 15 years later, 20 years later, and it'll still be there in the soil. It can produce and reproduce very slowly and carefully. And it can produce sexually. This is rare, rarer in a lot of these species in our environment, but it can occur, and this can be important for, for generating diversity within the pathogen. This is what the hyphae of it, the fungal threads, the threads of the organism that live in the soil and growing through the roots. So they're very, very tiny. We're talking 10, maybe 15 micrometers across the, the width of the growth that you can see there. So it's tiny, it's microscopic. You can pick up a root that's just been infected and you won't see anything on that root system because it is so microscopic. And all of these tiny spores that they produce are even smaller. So it's very, very tiny, very difficult to identify. And the first symptoms that we can start to see that it's in the soil might be that the, the roots are starting to brown off, rot away, or that the plant is starting to die. So it's very, very difficult to diagnose and very, very difficult to detect. These sporangia, these bodies that produce the, the, these little spores here, and this is probably a two millimetre long stretch of root system. So you can see there's huge numbers of these spore bodies starting to be produced. And each of these little zoospores here 
tiny little propagules that can spread through the soil very effectively. So it can produce vast numbers very quickly and they spread through the soil very, very quickly. And if you see it here, you can again see these sporangia, as we call them, with the zoospores inside them, large numbers being produced and they're moving through the soil. And what tends to happen is that the water in the soil pushes them down the drainage lines in, a, in an environment. So whether that's in a paddock, whether that's in the bush, whether it's in an orchard, it's always moving with the water. And you can see with these xanthoreas here that the lots of dead ones at the top and we've still got a few live ones down the bottom. The phytophthora is moving down through the soil. And every time you tread in infected soil and pull out your boot, you have the potential for being able to transmit that pathogen from one spot to another spot. And these zoospores, these little propagules that they're producing, have little arms at the front of them, so little propeller type organ um, uh, organelles that they produce and these enable it to move short, very short distances through the soil and move with the soil water. So it's a very clever organism from being able to propagate, to produce large numbers and then to move through the soil in a way that's very difficult to control, particularly if you've got issues in terms of drainage or movement of, of water through the soil. And as you can see, a small section of a root system can have huge numbers of these sporangia being produced. They are inevitably going to produce large numbers that are going to be very, very difficult to control from that point of view. Infection occurs on the roots, the zoospores, those little spores with the flagella out the front we just showed, move through the soil, they insist on the root, infect into the root system and then start to grow through the root system of the plant. So or everything is happening, of course, underground. They penetrate the roots in a moist situation. Infection always requires lots and lots of water in the soil. And that's probably why we're seeing lots of infection points all through the different areas around here as a result of inundation and movement of water through the soil, but also providing conditions for root infection to occur. And then the mycelium of the organism grows through the, the roots, killing one cell, moving on to the next, feeding on that, killing another cell, feeding on that, moving through the root system, and it's essentially creating a dysfunctional root system that's unable to extract moisture or nutrients out of the soil. So some of those earlier, sim earlier symptoms that you might see in infected plants could be yellowing of the foliage, it could be slight death of the foliage and dropping of the, dropping of the foliage. So it just looks like the plant is either drought stressed or nutrient stressed or just unwell. And these are the telltale factors that you might see uh, in terms of that, that sort of infection. The main symptoms, as I said, are yellowing of the foliage, wilting, dieback, all symptoms of nutrient and water stress. So often it's very difficult, particularly in drought periods, to be able to differentiate whether you have a disease or whether you have an issue with the plant just being able to cope with the environment. Symptoms are most severe when plants are first infected and then drought stressed. So what you effectively see is in wet periods, infection is happening, the pathogen is really going to town, eating the root system, creating a dysfunctional root system that's unable to extract enough moisture and nutrients out of the soil. But when the drought period hits or a short period of, of dry weather, because it's a dysfunctional root system, it cannot extract enough moisture out of the soil to be able to support the rest of the, the plant above ground. So it really is a, is a big issue in those sorts of situations. Flooding and high water levels obviously favour infection, but they also favour colonisation of the root system because usually in those situations, the root system is lacking oxygen because of the high moisture levels in the soil and is not able to, to, to fight off infection as well as it would if it was growing in, in a a soil system that had a little bit more availability of oxygen in the, the moisture. So we'll, quite often what we see in terms of the impact of the disease is infection happening in the really wet periods, moving across the environment, but when that dry period hits in, then all of a sudden you'll see lots and lots of trees starting to die or to die back. And that's a very typical situation and some of the situations that we've seen right across areas of eastern New South Wales, in fact. This is sort of typical of the yellowing of the foliage. We start to get intervenal chlorosis, yellowing between the veins. The veins might be more prominent in terms of the way in which they are visible. Sometimes in some species you'll start to see wilting of that foliage because the root system can't extract enough moisture. This is one of the plants at the Sydney Botanic Gardens. And in some situations you can get really severe wilting and necrosis and death 
uh, as a result of the pathogen. These are in some um, rhododendrons up at the Blue Mountains Botanic Garden. The susceptibility of different species varies depending on the, the host plant. Our classic uh, indicator species, particularly in natural ecosystems, are xanthoreas, grass trees. They're highly susceptible to the pathogen and as soon as you start to see some of these sorts of uh, scenarios, you know that Phytophthora is in those areas and, and starting to cause quite a bit of havoc uh, in those areas. And you can also see again how it's moving down the environment, uh, moving down the slope uh, in, in certain areas. These are some um, plants that we've done pathogenicity testing on just to show some of those symptoms that you might see. So you can see on your right hand side the healthy root system, big abundant root systems that are really very happy, but you can see the, the plants that have been infected with Phytophtha have you know, virtually zero root system available. So all of the feeder roots in particular have been nibbled on, chewed on, rotted away and, and broken down. So the plant obviously and given the state of these plants is essentially dead, have not been able to cope with the impact of the pathogen. Wallamai pine is a classic example of a plant that's super, super susceptible to this disease. It's obviously been growing in an area where that's never been, never experienced Phytophthora until um, sadly 2004 when it was introduced on somebody's boots. So the so infected soil came into that site through people illegally visiting the, the wild site and we knew that the plant was susceptible and then we've started to see the impact of the disease at the wild site. So that's a, a big impact of the, the pathogen on a species in that case and that's, this has um, resulted in us having to do a lot of work in trying to establish um, translocated populations, alternative populations outside the wild site so that we're able to cope with the, the presence of the pathogen. And a lot of species can be quite susceptible over long periods of time, these are bunya pines up at Bunya Mountain National Park. Huge big trees, 500, 600 year old trees. Topther has been introduced into that site and slowly over a period of time, combination of different environmental conditions, different impacts that have resulted in the disease being causing these sorts of impacts that you can see um, with the final outcome being a stump that looks like this. The pathogen just doesn't affect plant species Obviously, everything that lives on a plant will be impacted by the presence of, of Phytophthora in a particular site. So it's not just about trying to manage the impact on the plants. You've also got to start to think about the impact of those species that depend on those particular species. And we've seen a number of different animal species reduced in their abundance, in their population levels. Uh, moving into threat status as a result of the impact of these types of diseases. So with the impact of Phytophthora in biodiversity situations, we get a reduction in the level of biodiversity in the number of species that occur in a particular location, decline in the number of plant species, replacement of some of the susceptible species like things by things like sedges and rushes, very low diversity, very low ability to, to provide food for a whole range of different organisms and so that can be significant on the whole of the ecosystem and as a recognition of that these pathogens have been listed in both the New South Wales legislation and the, the federal legislation as key threatening processes for biodiversity in New South Wales and across Australia. Just in terms of the survival and longevity it survives in infected root material, it survives in the soil these can survive for a long period of time. I've put down 12 months, but you know our work has shown that they can survive. They can persist on some root systems for, for years and years and years and years. So it's really very difficult to, to eradicate it once you have it, have it there. So the best thing to do is to make sure that we don't bring it into a site. And it can go down quite a long way down into the soil. I often get people asking me, particularly in amenity situations in home gardens, and like, can we just remove the top you know, 600 mil of soil? Will that get rid of it? No, it won't. It moves down through the soil, and we've done work where we've been able to extract it from about 1.5 metres deep in the soil, and we hit bedrock there, then, so it's quite possible it could go even further. Oxygen levels tend to be important to a certain extent but it can survive in those sorts of conditions really really easy and and without too many problems at all managing the disease is is difficult whenever you go into a, a natural ecosystem into a park into a national park into a reserve i really strongly encourage you almost insist i do insist 
that you make, make efforts to clean your boots and any other implements that are likely to come into contact with the soil. A spray of your boots with 70% metho is quick, it's easy to do, and it gives you good control of these sorts of pathogens before you go into an area. So anytime you're going in to, to do a bushwalk in an area, regardless of whether you think there might be Phytophthora in there, you don't know what species of Phytophthora it is, whether it's there, how it's there, but really encourage you to spray your boots, stick to the paths, and um, that will minimise the likelihood of you introducing pathogen into to, uh, a particular area. You can see there we're insisting that um, Costa do that. We didn't spray his beard, but we could have. We've been working for a while on a, on a project which we called Stop the Rot, because we, we were particularly concerned about a high incidence of what we were starting to see in terms of in urban planting. So we did some work where we looked at the causes for a lot of the global failure of street trees and urban plantings, just to see what might be causing and whether this was a problem. We were getting lots of requests for diagnostics at the plant clinic at the gardens in Sydney, and we were getting lots of phytophthora out. We got some funding to do that, and these are the sorts of symptoms that we're seeing, new plants going into the, into the environment causing all sorts of problems. Plants dying, not surviving, not thriving, uh, and in the end really being a poor, you know, a waste of money a lot of effort from, you know, from council staff in various areas, a lot of wasted effort from volunteers often too as well. So we looked at that. These are the sort of typical symptoms that we were seeing. These are the sorts of plants that we were testing from in, in, in a range of nurseries to look at how it was, what were the problems. And one of the things that's really important is that sometimes it's really difficult to be absolutely 100% sure about whether a species you know, a particular individual plant is actually positive or negative. So, you know, these are just a few, you know, guess which people, most people would probably think that the outer two would be the, the, the negative one. But in, in, but in this case, it turned out that the middle one was, was negative and the outer one was positive, even though the middle one is one they used as a, an example of the sorts of symptoms that you might see. So you can't always be sure of what your, if you're getting a healthy looking plants that they are, they are the ones that are not causing the problems. Sometimes infection is hidden, sometimes when their plants are being grown they've been using suppressive uh, chemicals to minimise the impact and once that gets into the environment they can go rampant. So we've been working in that space and done a lot of work to, to see how it can work and one of the key things that we often talk about is the disease triangle. So if you Think about the, th the things that make that are important in terms of how a disease might impact in the environment, how, might, how, how it might be expressed. The disease triangle is really important. So you have to have a pathogen that is able to cause disease. You have to have a host that is susceptible and not a, there's a lot of variability between different species of plants. But critically what you have to have is a conducive environment to be able to express those diseases. And so this is typical is that the plants may look fabulous in the nursery but when they get into the harsher natural environment may quickly die off. So that's, that's what we were seeing and we were finding that we were getting a range of different Phytophthora species. We looked at a number of community nurseries, a number of commercial nurseries just to look at the the level of infection and sadly one of the things that we found was the very high incidence of, of Phytophthora in some of those nurseries. Not all the, were, were severe but there was certainly in some of them that was the case. In terms of the detection how we did this we're using a, um, a DNA based detection system now that's um, really very sensitive and very uh, accurate. Um, using very, very, very similar to the, um, the PCR tests that we use for COVID now, um, and then based on DNA sequence, we can identify it right down to the species. In the nurseries, we were finding about 23% of the, the nurseries were positive, Phytophthora positive, so it's a very high level, but not all nurseries were that high. So some people are producing fantastically clean, good plants, and they're following a process that works best for it. And what we're trying to do now is to work with the nursery industry and the green industry to be able to raise up that standard of, of knowledge and information about Phytophthora, but also reduce the level of infection, because I think that will serve both them, the community, and also the urban greening programs that we're, we're involved with. This is not unique to New South Wales. It's found all over the world. It's a symptom that's found in the UK, in Europe, very high in some parts of, of the world. But we do know that there are a range of 
guidelines that are available now that we're working through that are able to provide an opportunity to be able to reduce this level right down to 0% infection. So that's what we want to try and do. This will obviously involve some change to practices, probably bringing back some of the old practices that we know work, but also an understanding from the people who are purchasing plants that cheaper is not always best. You may, there may be an economic impact that this has on that. One of the things we're now working on is to develop batch leachate testing because our, our testing process with DNA and, and PCR testing can be quite expensive. So we're wanting to reduce the cost associated with the testing so that we can do large numbers of plants with one test in the same way that they did batch testing for COVID. So, and then also to draw the analogy with COVID to a certain extent, we're looking at rapid antigen testing tools that are available from the UK and testing them in our environment. They offer some benefit there. One of the interesting and exciting things that we're doing now is looking at training dogs to be able to detect the presence of Phytophthora both in nursery situations but also in the wild. We're still a little way away from where they're able to be, you know, we feel confident that they are able to detect it at a reasonable rate. but. They're, the dogs are fantastic, they're amazing, and we've just got some, through a, a national collaboration, we've just got some funding from the federal government to further explore this so that we can work on it completely. And, and you know, any day in the field is a good day, but any day in the field with a dog is an even better day, so it's, it's been fantastic. The, Alice in these pictures is just an amazing dog. Just a little bit about management and control options. Management, prevention and avoidance are the main principles. It's so much cheaper, so much easier if you prevent and, and avoid this pathogen. Remember that just one zoospore can start an epidemic. So any of those techniques for um, hygiene are, are fantastic from that perspective. Um, remember chemicals like phosphonate, potassium phosphonate is, is an amazing chemical, um, safe, easy to use but it just suppresses the pathogen, it doesn't kill it. So that's an important thing to do. And once it's infested, it will stay that way for a long period of time. The key sources of infection are water moving across the site, humans in their dirt, potting mix components, pots and containers, soil, propagation material, and whether it's historically present in the environment. So we are the problem in most of these cases, like everything, and we need to be careful of that. There are a number of effective management practices. Come clean, go clean is something that we work across in a lot of pathology areas and a lot of agriculture. Talking about footpath entries, we do a lot of that. Drainage control is really important in terms of landscape and trying to mitigate and manage where you might have an infection already and you don't want it to go into another area. Sometimes it's not practical and quite difficult to do, but it is possible to think about it when planning landscapes, when planning green spaces to make sure that you're not always going to create problems through bad drainage, through bad water movement. So there's a number of engineering solutions that can be indicated into that. Nursery hygiene is a really critical thing, I think, in terms of being able to manage the disease into the future and monitoring plant health is important. I've talked a little bit about some of the control options in natural ecosystems. We work a lot with the national parks across all sorts of different jurisdictions in terms of managing pathogens and preventing people bringing in the pathogens into their areas. And it's got quite elaborate now. The one on your left is the footpaths at Lamington National Park. In the middle is the footpaths at Bunya Mountains National Parks, and these will be the footpaths that are going into the main on Lord Howe Island and some of the older school ones where you dip your foot into the chemical, a little bit less useful. These are only as good, obviously, if people are using them and following those procedures. Just a quick note about phosphonates, potassium phosphonate, phosphonic acid. There's a number of different trade names, anti-rot, agrophos. It works against Phytophthora and other RMIC's infecting plants. It's quite amazing. It works really well in, in places like the avocado industry where they're doing regular injections, regular applications. Um, obviously less useful in natural ecosystems, although in the Stirling Ranges National Park in WA they have done aerial applications of some of these in particularly badly infested areas. It works quite well. It's not toxic to the pathogens. It won't eradicate it. We've tried to use it at the Wallamai Pine site. It's very difficult to use in those situations. 
Um, and it may have a role in terms of threatened species applications where we're wanting to save particular small populations of plants from the pathogens. But it will mask the presence of the pathogen, so it can be sometimes more problematic than, than useful. I'll just do a, a, a couple of quick comments about cypress canker. It, quite often it's not unusual to see cypress canker plus Phytophthora impacting a plants together or separately. And it's sometimes very difficult to differentiate between the two. Typically, and of course real life situations are not always typically, you do start to see the resin forming, particularly on some of the cypress species when you have cypress canker. And it's starting at spot infections, usually somewhere up in the canopy, and then it can spread very rapidly through the canopy of those sorts of plants. Uh, it's caused by a couple of different species of fungi, true fungi in these cases, and they have these spores which get splashed around, blown around, moved around by birds and the like that can move through the environment quite quickly, particularly in wet, windy weather. So it can be quite difficult to control from that point of view. A lot of the canker species are quite susceptible and there's probably a whole list there that you're thinking that's all the things we grow up here. There's a little, there's an, there is an element of that quite a reasonable host range from that point of view, tending to be in those Cupressus and Cupressus cyparis species, less so in the fugas and junipers and things like that, but it's problematic. And I'm just going to finish with a couple of slides of something that's on, I'm on, on my hobby horse about at the moment. This is a, a, a beetle and a fungal association that's just come into Western Australia over the last year. Polyphagus shot hole borer, if you know anybody in Perth, know that they're cutting down literally thousands of trees now trying to eradicate this particular beetle. So I just want you to be cognizant about it, looking out for it out there in the environment because it has the potential to be a hugely problematic pest. And a lot of the exotic species that we grow in the Southern Highlands or up in the Blue Mountains and even in the Sydney region can are quite susceptible to these, this combination of this tiny beetle. You can see it's two millimetres long tiny, um, causing these tiny holes, but they introduce a fungus into the tree and that spreads through the tree and causes problems and dieback and all sorts of things. It's native to Southeast Asia, just come into Perth, um, we don't want it in New South Wales, particularly on things like box elders, plane trees, figs, oaks and coral trees, but there's a preponderance of, of those sorts of species grown down here, so keep an eye out for those sorts of species. I mapped the susceptible species to the Royal Botanic Gardens Sydney site. It's not a good outcome and every street tree in the city of Sydney is a, well, a large number of plane trees and you can see the sorts of symptoms on a plane tree um, and you're looking out for these little um, tubes that come out and frass associated with the trees but they cause a devastating dieback of the plant, kills them, but their biosecurity implications are huge. So keep an eye out for things like that. But there are lots of other pathogens out there. Sudden oak death is a huge potential problem that we could have here. Another Phytophthora species, but an airborne one. Carry dieback of Phytophthora species. But all sorts of other pathogens are out there. Be aware, if you see something that's problematic, report it either to the council or to the Department of Primary Industries, just so that we're aware we can detect it, we can look it up and, and try to see where it's going. Thank you.